Good evening, viewers, and welcome to the first edition of this year's Factory Berlin's On the Red Couch event series. A special thanks to Beats by Dr. Dre, who has powered this event. I'm Mercedes, the startup manager here at Factory Berlin. We are a community of founders, freelancers, corporates, and students with over 3,500 members. We create our diverse community to connect, collaborate, and thrive together. Supporting a community has never been more important than now, and I'm convinced that after the conversation with our guests, you'll feel more inspired to make your ideas become a reality. Today we have a very special guest, a unique woman. I've known her for a few years, and I can truly confirm that she's one of the most inspiring, kind, and humble women I ever met, if not the most. <laughs> Those are qualities that a real leader must have. At Factory Berlin, we are constantly encouraging and supporting the leaders of today and tomorrow, and continuously spotlight and encourage female entrepreneurs and founders to driven initiatives. One of those is our Stealth Mode program. We are supporting 10 mentees from different industries, from fintech, social impact, arts, femtech, to empower them and help them to become the change makers of the future. Factory Berlin has always put an effort in bringing creativity and tech together. This format is a key example as it gives artists and experts from across the creative and the tech sphere a chance to connect with the Berlin startup and tech ecosystem, as well as inspire our Factory Berlin community. Please let me introduce you to my dear Jeanette Epps, NASA astronaut and her moderator this evening, Andrea Magdalena, founder of CZSO. Thank you both, and thank you Beats by Dr. Dre for making it possible. Thanks for having me, Mercedes. <laughs> Likewise. Hi, everyone. I hope you can hear me. Hear you. Uh, we can hear you. Excellent. Cool. We'll get, we'll get started then. Hi. Um, my name is Andrea Magdalena, and I'll be your moderator today. I am uh, currently in Los Angeles, but I'm originally from Romania via London. After spending about seven years in London, I had moved to Los Angeles to pursue my passion in music and diversity and inclusion. I am the founder of She Said So, a global network of women who work in the music industry. And our values are those of collaboration, diversity, inclusion, mutual support. We have a beautiful manifesto that um, values and highlights these uh, principles that we've built our network upon um, that is equal pay, equal opportunity, uh, zero tolerance for any kind of um, uh, sexual harassment or, or uh, inappropriate behavior. And I think these are all values that um, can easily be translated into other industries as well. I have to start by saying I'm incredibly honored. It, it is my pleasure and my privilege to be speaking to you today, Jeanette. Hi, this is the first time we actually meet. Yes, it's a pleasure to meet you. I love what you're doing with um, your foundation, she said. Um, so that is um, um, it's gonna be one of those organizations that kind of change the way things go, especially in the music industry and in other areas too. So. I hope so. I hope so. Uh, yeah. We we keep fighting the fight. That's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. Funnily enough, I had actually visited uh, one of the NASA stations in Mountain View. I I have a yes. friend who works there. She's exploring life uh, out out in space. She hasn't found anything yet, but <laughs> the exploration keeps going. And it was I remember being so fascinated by. Um, well, by space in general and, and, and how humans approach that. But be, before we jump into a converse, a proper conversation, I wanted to introduce you briefly for, for those who are um, listening in for the first time. Um, as a former CIA officer and now a NASA astronaut, we are excited to hear about your journey and your career with NASA, but also beyond, including um, diversity in STEM, which is which is one of the reasons I'm uh, I'm here having this conversation with you today, um, and and we we'll, I I personally really look forward to sharing some inspiration and and um, telling your story to the world because it's really inspiring and it's a story of of resilience, uh, yeah. which is particularly 
relevant now that we're going through this global crisis together as a planet. Um, Jeanette, you spent many years working at Ford, where you even received the US patent for your research. After Ford, you joined the CIA for seven years, working as a technical intelligence officer. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, at NASA, you completed many years of training, I believe over 10, until you were officially right. selected to become an astronaut. It must have yeah. been an honor to be picked to go into space. Oh, very <laughs> much so, yes. Let's, let's actually start there. Why, why space in the first place? Well, it's interesting because um, my career has been about research, um, science, and just learning as much as I can. And um, not that I've learned everything here on Earth, but to me, when you open up um, not just the Earth and you start looking at the moon and you start looking beyond the moon, um, it just the opportunities to learn something new just continue to grow. And so for me, space is kind of a, a logical next step. I'm still learning much here on Earth, but to learn more about what's happening on the moon, what happened on the moon, and then how we can push for further and further beyond the moon um, to Mars. And then, you know, once we get to Mars, what will we do next? Go to the, the belt, maybe to maybe beyond our solar system. So. Yeah, this is, um, as I said, all super fascinating. And especially for those of us who don't work in science, it, it seems like such a far-fetched dream. And yet here we are, you know, we, we've been in space. It's been more than 60 years, I guess, at this point. Uh, that we've, we've had 20 years of um, the International Space Station. So mm -hmm. and over the past 20 years, we've always had someone living and working in space. Wow. That yeah. thought alone is just mind-boggling to me. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. and you, you're currently Beautiful. still at NASA, right? I am. I'm currently working still in the astronaut corps, <clears throat> still learning a lot of new things and um, still working as a Capcom, um, doing all the things that um, we would normally do while we wait for a mission. Got it. So the possibility of going um, out into space is still, is still there. Um, yes, it is, which is, um, is, uh, is still amazing that, um, that I, there is a possibility. So mm -hmm. um, even though over the past um, over 10 years now, I've learned a tremendous amount. I've done a tremendous amount of training as well. And so even with that, you know, I never get tired of some of the things that we, we, we get to do. And unfortunately, you have to join the astronaut corps and leave your job. And, and that's the only way you can get to do some of these things, like learning to do a spacewalk, learning to fly the T-38 jets, learning uh, Russian language, um, working in Star City, Russia, to train with our, our fellow cosmonauts. Um, so I've had a lot of really um, great opportunities, and I've learned a tremendous amount. Speaking of that, by the way, of all that training and the, the, the amount of time you have to put in in order to get to a point where th that possibility even exists in the first place, it's, we're talking yes. about more than 10 years of training. I'm sure that must have been incredibly hard. Um, yes. how, how did you push through? What, what kept you going? Well, the end goal is what keeps you going. If you want something bad enough, you're going to push through to the end. And also, you know, sometimes there are, you know, times when you don't feel like doing that. You have to have a good support system that will help get you over those tough times. And so for me, having my family, um, being able to talk things out with them, um, being able to get encouragement from them, um, really helped get me through all those tough times. I uh, watched a couple of talks that you gave uh, in, in the past couple of years, and, and I remember being very um, impressed by how well and how thoughtfully you're speaking about your colleagues and how important teamwork is in not only um, completing a successful task yeah. or mission, but also in helping you on a personal level to cope with all the pressure. Um, yeah. T t yes. Tell us a little bit more about that. How does teamwork happen in, uh, in space or in such a confined space? Well, um, I recently did caves in Slovenia. 
And this was back in September where uh, myself and uh, five other colleagues, we learned how to do um, uh, spelunking. We were learning speleology. And so we ended up um, learning how to dive into a cave and come out of the cave. And then we lived in one cave for five nights. And so it sounds, it sounds, um, no, you're just kind of living in the cave. Well, it was actually one of them to me. And I think, you know, I'm talking to several other colleagues, one of the most dangerous analog missions that we do where there's real consequences to your actions. And so having that actually gives you um, a good um, idea of who your colleagues are because you really have to, every day before we went uh, hiking in the cave, um, the caves were wet. There's lots of rocks and boulders. There's steep inclines. Um, you know, we have to climb out and do uh, certain things and climb up. And it's very slippery because it's mostly wet in the caves because all the rain and everything comes down in there. So you could easily slip, fall, really, really hurt yourself. And even in the past, there were people who have um, died doing this. And so we had to work as a team to get everyone into the cave, do our research, do um, mapping of the cave itself, and even putting on our gear to go through the our wetsuits <clears throat> to go through the um, river that's underground. So getting everyone out, sorry, <laughs> getting everyone um, in and out of the cave and back to the camp safely was a big deal. Mm -hmm. um, it, there were definitely real consequences. And as a team, um, you know, having that one person that you can talk to about what's going on and that one person who's gonna help you stay safe um, even though there's six of us, we all work together, but having that one person that you can talk to, um, it was really, um, uh, it, you know, I think that's what helped me get through. And my colleague, um, Joe Acaba was that person. So we all spent, there was, it was myself, Joe Acaba, um, Kolya Chub, Takuya Onishi, um, gosh, um, we also had, um, Sorry about that. <laughs> we also had um, a gentleman from Canada, Joshua Kutrick, and Alexander Gers from Germany. So as you can see, we have these very diverse, very international group. Um, a lot of women always ask me, were you the only woman? And I never think about that because I'm a, I'm a member of the team. I'm not, mm -hmm. I'm not the woman on the team. I'm a, I'm a member of the team. And the guys treated me as such. And so that was... Um, that was probably one of my favorite analog missions that I was able to do in the group. And having that one person who really you can talk to you about anything that's difficult and get through um, was priceless. We spent two and a half weeks together and um, we went in friends and we came out friends. <laughs> it was a nice time. That's beautiful. I, I'd love to touch on on that idea of being a woman in 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 science and a woman at and a, and a black woman in science and at NASA. But first, I wanted to go uh, dive deeper a little bit into these experiences, both from an individual and a person, a group perspective, a teamwork perspective. Mm -hmm. as well. um, you also spend some time underwater. I read somewhere. Yeah. Is yeah. that mm -hmm. that different? By the way, is it is different. Um, nine days underwater was far easier than hiking in and out of the caves only because um there are real consequences with living underwater as well because of the um, threat of decompression sickness as well and so um living underwater you know there again we had a very international group we had aki hoshide as our commander um tomal peske from the european space agency and mark van de Heij from the army and then we had two habitat techs that lived with us so it's always six people because on the International Sp Space Station, um, in the past, usually there's about six people at a time on the space station. Mm -hmm. And so the six of us, we have to, you know, we're in a very small compartment. We eat um, dinner together. Um, we do our public affairs events. We do our exercise, our experiments in this one small compartment. And then we had bunk beds pretty much. We slept across from each other. So you're in tight quarters. And um, if you, you know, I, I love to tell students about um, how you can be the smartest person in the room, all A's, brilliant. But if you can't get along with people and you're not flexible, um, you won't go very far. Because I think in the future, we're gonna have more and more of these um, group collaborations. 
to um, develop better and better ideas. You know, the idea of diversity is not just with gender and race, but um, experiences and diversity of thought. And bringing all of these different things together, you can come up with a, a better idea than if you had one person come up with it alone. So all of these experiences, um, you know, they really do pre prepare you for even an event like this with um, being quarantined. And, you know, you're quarantined with a few people and, you know, things, you're in a big house, but on the space station, you're in a, you're in a, you're on the space station, there's six of you and you can call home, you can talk to people, but you still just can't go out to grab a burger like right here on earth. Even now you can't really go sit at a restaurant and do those things. So it prepares you for quarantine almost and isolation in a way. And I think, you know, being the only female, for me, I never really focused on that because, you know, that can be a whole, I mean, there can be so many things that, um, you know, you can start thinking about if you focus on that. So for me, what I always focused on was the mission and getting the mission done. And so during the whole event, it never really, um, I never really focused on being the only female, much less the only black female in the group. And so focusing on the mission was really what um, my mindset was. So that, you know, you can be a, a big part of the group, you can contribute, you can help your colleagues with other things. And, you know, if your mind is wrapped around, um, you know, being the only female and this matters and that matters, then you really can't focus on being a good crewmate, if that makes sense. Um, and it does come into play with some other people, but I try to let that be their problem if it's, if it's a problem for them. And, you know, sometimes, you know, they do make it your problem. And then you have to face it and you have to, um, and what I like to say, you have, you have to combat it in some ways and you, you can't let that stop you though. Um, because there's always gonna be people who are gonna, and you know, I don't care if you're male, female, black, you know, whatever race you are, there's always gonna be opposition somewhere. And so you have to learn how to, um, you, one of the big things I had to learn was when to fight and when not to. So how do you pick and choose your battles? And in tight quarters, like um, being in the cave with a group of guys or being underwater with a group of guys, um, conflict resolution is very important and being open and honest and direct with people is um, very important. That way you can resolve things quickly. And sometimes that doesn't work because you know, you gotta have two people who are willing to be that in order for it to work. But you know, I can only do so much. And for me, I, I try to do my part and then from there, focus on the mission. That's the important thing, especially in places like underwater where there are major threats. It is dangerous. You can truly get hurt. Um, and in the cave, I mean, you can truly hurt yourself, fall, break a leg, break more than just a leg. And so um, there, were, there are consequences for not focusing when you're in these environments. And would you say the pressure is higher on an intellectual or a physical level, or is it is it a combination of both? Well, I think that the the pressure is definitely mental. Um, and you know, one of the things that I like to do is I like to work out. I like to run, especially now that um, we're in quarantine, running outside even with a mask, um, and really relieving stress that way is very important because I don't think um, the physical stress. Um, it can be overcome easily by having a tougher mind. And so your mind can help you push through anything physically mm -hmm. if, you are, if you have a strong enough mind. And so for me, relieving the stress is, help, is what helps build my mind and keep me at a point where I can think clearly and focus. And then also on top of that, having friends who will be honest with you and tell you the truth and be direct with you. If you don't have someone who's gonna give you good constructive criticism when you need it most, then your thinking is gonna be out of whack and you'll never really have um, a release of that mental stress that you could have. I was uh, going to ask, is, is aerospace as an industry a competitive space? 
It is very competitive, especially now that um, when you look at the news and you see everything that's going on, we have this new Artemis program going to go back to the moon and stay up on the moon. Um, there's a lot more students entering aerospace and not just mechanical engineering now. So with that, um, you know, and then there's also a lot more uses with like UAVs and drones. And so um, aerospace is definitely a very competitive um, group to work in right now because there's going to be a lot of students coming up and um, they're going to be majoring in helicopters, um, propulsion, aerodynamics, I mean even just UAVs, fixed wing, and so you're going to have a lot of people out there who are majoring in aerospace and not just that, they're going to want to go into the space program out as well. So the competition even to get into the astronaut corps um, with so many more students entering aerospace and wanting to work at NASA and then eventually become an astronaut. There's a huge amount of competition, <laughs> which is kind of nice. Uh, yeah. I'll tell you, when I, when I joined aerospace back in 1992, I was a physics major undergrad and um, my advisor undergrad kept asking me, well, why do you want to go into aerospace? You know, the industry is pretty depressed and you, you likely won't find a job. And I'm so glad I didn't listen to him because now um, aerospace is a booming, booming industry right now. I guess in a sense, there are quite a few parallels there with the, with the music industry, which is where yes. I come from. Um, and obviously there is a lot of competition between creatives, but oftentimes they are forced to work together. And, and yeah. you, you almost, I can almost create a parallel with the music studio where you're, together with a group of people for maybe a few months at a time trying to make this album happen or, or whatever it is. How yeah. does that competitiveness play with the spirit, spirit of teamwork when you're forced to work together and develop such a uh -oh. close relationship? <laughs> well, so, so the problem is that um, the competitiveness can be a showstopper in some ways if you let it. And um, it's, it's hard to um, so for example, um, so I worked at Ford Motor Company and then I went on to the CIA. So one is a private industry, one is a government um, agency. And the differences between the two, the cultures is what was the major difference and what was the driving factor for that culture. And so it's the same thing in the aerospace industry. It's not so much that it's competitive, but understanding the culture of the competitiveness and why it's there. And so once you understand that, it's easier to navigate. It's still difficult, don't get me I'm wrong, but once you understand what that culture of competitiveness and where it comes from and how it works, then you can move a little bit easier. And so the competitive nature is, um, I mean, if you think about it, um, it is very difficult to get a job at NASA. And so you wanna look like you're the best and the brightest and you wanna make sure you're doing well. Um, and you want to have that advantage, like you know someone that works that, that work there, or you have the best grades in your class, or you come from the best school. So those are the competitive items outside. But once you're in, then it's, it's still competitive, very competitive. Um, and it's competitive. Um, and one of the things to mitigate that is understanding the culture of that competitiveness and how to navigate that. Do you feel like working with a diverse team um, and diverse from all those different perspectives that you mentioned, yeah. uh, gender, ethnicity, the culture they're coming from, is yeah. that a plus or, or is it hindering a mission? Well, I think, um, so um, what, so I think for um, every person on that group, um, if they understand how it can be, um, an added benefit. Um, like I, I did notice in Nemo and even in caves, um, especially in Nemo though, the individuals there, they understood um, the mission and we worked together and not focused on the other things, but everybody's idea was included and everyone had a voice. And um, when you have people who understand that and actively incorporate that in the mission to get the best outcome, it, 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 it's the best situation you can possibly have. And that doesn't always happen, but that's why I'm glad that there's organizations like yours, um, like Factory Berlin, and organizations that are actively trying to incorporate these ideas and come up with better and better solutions. And that's why I think even though we have had this big tech boom over the last 20, 25 years, I think it's only gonna get better 
with organizations like yours and um, Factory Berlin. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, speaking of diversity, while, while we're on this topic, um, as, a, as a woman of color at, at NASA, what, yeah. what do you think needs to be, what needs to fundamentally change for a more diverse future? Because oftentimes discrimination is um, invisible and not intentional. It's, it's a result of years and years of systemic, um, yeah, systemic discrimination. What are, what are some suggestions you, you might have? Well, I will say that I think looking at NASA, you see that it does better than a lot of other places when it comes to women. And even in different um, centers, you see that it does better when it comes to diversity. But even with that said, there's still issues because the issues aren't necessarily on the bigger picture of NASA, but on the individual level. Mm -hmm. And so um, you can have a lot of training, but you, you really can't just um, change the way someone thinks. And so, you know, one of the things that um, you know, I, I think it's hard to change an organization or a person. Um, you know, it takes generations for things to really change, but you got to start somewhere. And so one of the things I see, especially in companies and like yours and Factory Berlin, and that is that um, just starting somewhere and trying to incorporate these ideas and, you know, to get rid of that institutional type of, of thinking. And it's that institutional type thinking that keeps things the same and it keeps institutionalized racism the same. But incorporating all these new ideas of how you include people and having open discussions like this um, is priceless. Um, I've, um, you, you know, one of the first interviews I did when I was removed from flight was in Berlin. And I was totally blown away with the um, directness and the honest, honest conversations that were going on. And that is, um, what needs to happen and you know i think calling out um things that are false and genuinely false and everyone knows it's false and being honest about that and changing it is is um what has to happen and if things like this happen how do you fix it how do you rectify the situation and i think that's where the problem comes in when people aren't willing to fix the situation and so the willingness to um to say, okay, well, this happened and be direct and honest about it. And how do you rectify that? And, and you know, not just um, with that individual, but look at it across the board in, in an equal way and put things into proper context. And then, um, and that way you can have a more um, in-depth um, look at the problem and really kind of focus on, you know, how can we fix this? As long as you have all of the um, information and then you move forward, I think there's always a way to find a solution. But you don't find that honesty always. <laughs> that's, that's true. And you're absolutely right about um, having these frank conversations and, and in order to create awareness. Because we, we've been around for five years in the music business and we started at a time when these conversations weren't taking place. Fast forward mm -hmm. five, six years, things are very different now, not just in the music industry, but in, across all levels, we are we are talking about diversity and, and, and people are starting to understand that it's not just a nice to have, but it's extremely important to drive yeah. our society forward in the most meaningful, positive way possible. I, I definitely agree. As, as a student, um, did you find the situation was similar? Were there fellow uh, women um, studying STEM um, in, in the same numbers as, as men? No, there, there weren't. And um, there were great women that were with me, like Ann Spence and Anita Tracy and um, Megan McClure. So we were all in graduate school together, but there were always more men. And so I was very fortunate in that I had other women to look at. And they, you know, one of the things that I loved was that um, most of them never made it an issue about being the female in the group or anything. Um, they kind of just dug their heels in it and did a great job. And that was the example that I had. And, you know, this is at a time at the University of Maryland where the majority of the students were from other countries. 
So it's not just we're competing with other Americans, we were competing with other students from other countries who were, you know, likely in the top 10 of their country, not just the class. So, you know, even that, um, that whole dynamic of being a female with a lot of international students, and the majority of the time, those international students didn't ever have females in their class. And, um, but they, the guys that we um, interacted with and that were in class with us, I mean, to this day, I'm friends with a lot of them, majority of them. And they were wonderful to us while in graduate school. And um, even now, I can call um, one of some of these guys and ask for advice. And, you know, it's not an issue. And they never, um, you know, looked at me as the female in the group. But, you know, I was one of the students um, at the University of Maryland with them. So I've had some great experiences. I've had some bad ones too, but um, overall, um, I've had the um, majority of the people that I keep in contact with and I keep close are the good ones. Great, great. And what do you think we can do to attract more young girls into STEM education from a young, younger age? How can we make that more attractive? And see, so one of the things I've been noticing and some of the studies show that girls at about the age nine or so, they start um, falling off of wanting to do science and math and, and technical things. So there's a push now, and I think um, I'm trying to get more and more into talking to girls who are about nine to 10 years old and trying to convince them that, and, and not just convince them, but show them experiences where they still like STEM. They still like anything that has to do with science. They want to participate in these things. So showing them different options and keeping them engaged is one of the ways that I'm trying to do that now, but I'm sure there's um, people out there who are much better at um, communicating with this age that can help with, okay, well, here's how you would target this age group. And this is how you would engage them in order to, to see if you can keep them um, interested in STEM. And so it's not an easy task, but I think starting at an earlier age, like maybe eight, nine, and 10 is the way to go. I agree. I agree. And I think highlighting um, women and other, you know, minorities like yourself who are in this industry, who are active and successful, that's very important. Re representation, because it shows other young women of color that they too can be there. Um, and, and that's something we, we're trying to do at She Said So with, uh, with women in music and, and other gender minorities as well. But I think beyond gender, there is this, a really beautiful story of resilience there because obviously we're talking about um, someone who's pursuing a career uh, and someone who's pursuing a dream of going into space, someone who needs to commit to intense training um, over a really long period of time. We're talking about 10 years and we're in 2020, a, a time when things move so fast, we're used to immediate gratification. You almost yeah. have to adopt a super athlete um, uh, mentality and, and stick with it. Yeah. How, how, do you, how do you find that motivation um, in, inside that to keep you going for so many years, especially after um, you know uh, something like being pulled off the off the original mission for reasons unknown to you. Well, so the the concept of resilience it starts way before you get to the event, and you know there's things that you you need to do and have in place as you're going through because no career is like a straight path to anything. And um, in, unconsciously, I probably did a lot of things that I didn't realize I was doing because, um, you know, I was, um, Janet and I, my twin sister and I, um, our parents aren't scientists or engineers. And so we were kind of bucking the system in a way, but not really realizing it. And, you know, you always have people who are uh, the naysayers. And how do you tell them, oh, no, no, I'm going to actually do this and you can't stop me. And having that kind of um, mentality that you really love what you're doing, you have a passion for it. So I think that's where it starts. You got to have a love and a passion for whatever it is that you're pursuing. And so that's going to help um, keep you driving forward. But I also mentioned the other thing is that I had people around me who helped me understand uh, who I am 
and what I'm about. And having a strong foundation and a sense of self is very important. And the people around you can help you with that um, because you need people who are gonna be um, honest with you, give you really good constructive criticism to help correct you along the, right, the way and show you who you are and help you to understand that. So becoming self-aware and um, self-confident in the positive sense that you, you know who you are. Um, other people don't know what's inside you. So why would you allow someone else to come and tell you that you can't do these things? If this is what's inside you and you have um, a passion and a desire to do this, even though it's hard, um, you should press forward and do it anyway. Um, I wouldn't let someone else who has no clue what's inside me just because I look a certain way doesn't mean I can't do these things. And so I think having that sense of self is very, very important when it comes to resilience. Um, and the reason I say that is because when things happen and you don't understand, if you don't understand um, yourself and how you work and operate and how you think, then people will be able to um, push you out um, from every which direction. And if you aren't able to stand solid in who you are, then you, you pretty much don't have anything. So the important thing is to um, get to a point where you can, um, if someone comes to you and say, hey, well, you can't do this because you're, my answer is always, well, why can't I? And why not me? Why this person and why not me? Especially if we have the same credentials. And so that's the, that's the other part of this is, you know, being prepared for any opportunity that comes along. Okay, making sure you've done your work and you're prepared and having these things behind you, when things happen, you can say, no, I did this, I did that. I, I made sure I was prepared here and I prepared in this way. And having that solid sense of self so that you can actually um, think straight and then come up with a plan from there. But also another aspect of um, resilience in, and one of the things I've been discussing with a good friend of mine is this idea of being vulnerable. And so, you know, being vulnerable in other people, that all goes back to just being um, direct and honest, not just with yourself, but with other people about how you feel, about what happened, and how you're gonna work through it. And putting yourself out there when things like this happen, there's a tendency for a victim to feel like they did something. And, you know, this whole mentality of, you know, I didn't do anything wrong and understanding that as the victim, you shouldn't be ashamed of anything. Why are you ashamed? Um, and so, you know, and having these conversations with people and asking me, how did I get through? And I said, well, just understanding, you know, what happened, how it happened and being open and honest and direct about it was very important. And understanding that, you know, the shame that a victim feels or the shame that someone you know, even just the idea of being removed. So many people, you know, they feel shame and they feel, there's a lot of things that go along with that. But, you know, being honest about it helps you cope with it and deal with it faster, I think. So there are so many. I think, oh, you're Yes, we're cool. back. Um, yeah, no problem. <laughs> I think my internet uh, got stuck for a while, but I, I was going to say that there are so many, again, parallel stories with music, so many musicians, famous artists who are now at the top of their game, who, um, uh, you know, were given a lot of no's before they got to that yes. Yeah. And, and they had exactly. to stick with it and believe in themselves um, and, and maybe reinvent themselves a few times, which is something that you've done as well, right? CIA, yeah. NASA. What, what would be your advice for someone? And, and especially now that we're going through this collective global crisis, many of us are forced to yeah. find a new path and reinvent ourselves. What would your advice be for, for someone going through this? Well, in my career, I did take a lot of risks. But um, they were calculated risks. And I made sure that I was prepared, um, prepared for any opportunity that could come up. And so, but even if I wasn't fully prepared candidate for that spot, and I could learn anything. So the biggest thing is um, understanding the risk that you're taking and being willing, being very willing to start over again. Because it takes a lot of energy and um, not just energy, um, 
it takes a lot of your time up from, away from your family and different things to, to reinvent yourself and and um, really start contributing and being a part of this new venture. So it's, it's a lot of energy that has to go into reinventing yourself, but it's, it's worth it in the end. And every time you do it, it gets easier and easier though. That's the other thing. <laughs> so, so that actually makes it nice that every time you do it, it just makes doing it even easier easier the next time. I have, um, I have one more question for you before maybe we have to um, jump into Q&A. We have questions okay. From, okay. from our digital audience that Mercedes will, uh, will read out to us. Um, I wanted to ask you about mentorship because this is something that I've learned is very important and very useful in the music business in terms of um, dr driving diversity forward, but also uh, driving innovation forward within within an industry. How does does mentorship happen within NASA or within the aerospace um, industry, and and how important? Oh, it definitely happens. And um, I, for me, I say that it's so important because um, one of the things is that when you come into a new place, um, understanding the culture is half the battle. And if you can find a mentor that suits you and works for you and you can communicate easy with, easily with and they can communicate easily with you, and it has to be a mutual kind of agreement. But finding that person that can help you through, like we were just talking about reinventing yourself, that person that can help mentor you through that reinvention of yourself is, is crucial. So what I would recommend is, um, you know, finding a mentor that suits you and that, you know, um, you kind of think similarly. And the reason I say that is because if you're just paired up with someone arbitrarily and you're just kind of given a mentor, um, I majority of the time it never works. It never works. But if you have a mentor where you have some things in common, um, you eventually actually become friends, then that is the best situation because you'll get a lot of great um, honest and direct feedback and that person can also be one of those individuals that can give you constructive feedback when you need it. So um, mentorship in the aerospace, especially in the astronaut corps and being at NASA in general is um, crucial, I think. But finding the right mentor is the key. And, and how do you go about that? Do you simply identify that person and go and ask or is there another process? Well, so, so there is a formal process here, but for me, the best way it worked was, you know, fortunately, you know, I, I just find the person who, um, <laughs> what I, you know, someone who is willing to tell me the truth. And, you know, they don't know me that well, but I'm a new person and they're willing to sit down and talk to me. And I would go through several people and, and um, subconsciously interview them <laughs> and kind of figure out who is more like-minded to me and who's willing to tell me important things and willing to keep me honest as well. Um, but it, for me, it was sort of an interview process that was subconscious. And then all of a sudden I realized like, wow, this is a, that was great advice. Um, I'm gonna go ask again. And then I'm constantly asking and <laughs> constantly meeting with them, um, but only when their schedule would permit. So it is not easy to find the right mentor. Um, it may take a little trial and error. I mean, going through the formal route, formal route initially is um, can work because they'll, you know, I think in the formal route that people now realize they try to find people with similar backgrounds and things like that. Um, but that doesn't always work either. And so starting there is not a bad point uh, to start, but also looking for individuals that you know, inspire you and that, um, you know, you can get on their calendar and go talk to them and see if that would be a, a fit. And I've been fortunate in um, just being on, the, in fact, um, I'm on a board of trustees with my undergrad. I volunteer to do this. And um, one of the women on the board, um, she said she would be my mentor. And it has turned out to be one of the best relationships, um, mentor, mentee relationships I've ever had. And so, and that was just, she was the person who identified me as a person she wanted to mentor. And she was right. So sometimes that'll happen too. I love it. I love it. Yeah. The power of mentorship and collaboration. Yes. 
Um, all right, I'll pass it over to Mercedes uh, so we can take questions from, from the audience, if now is the good time. Well, um, first of all, thank you again both. Um, thank you, Andrea, for guiding this amazing conversation. And thank you again, Jeanette, for, your, for being so honest with, with us. We, have, we do have a few questions. Um, so yeah, let's go through them, Jeanette. So we have here... Yeah. Um, one question: What areas of a space research, uh, sorry, what areas of a space research hold the greatest promise for advances for life on Earth? Wow! So I think um, <laughs> top <laughs> top one for for the first question. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, no. Actually, I don't think this is tough because I think for me, um, understanding the human body is going to be um, the biggest thing, the biggest hurdle to getting us to live further and further outside the protection of the earth. And so even going to the moon, we have a lot less protection. We're exposed to much more radiation. And you know that can affect us on the cellular level, yeah. um, affect our DNA. So understanding how the human body works outside of the earth's protection and developing countermeasures for that. Um, one of the things that they developed early on was these um, countermeasures to bone dense, for bone density loss. And so it does help patients here on Earth with osteoporosis. And so that was one of the beginning um, areas where we saw the greatest impact for research on the space station and here on Earth. Um, so for me, uh, there's all kinds of things that can happen too, like um, different materials. Um, uh, but I think for me, the human body is going to be the most interesting thing that we're going to see um, and how it changes when we're outside of the Earth. Earth's protection and how we can develop countermeasures. It could be stem cell research. It can be all different um, types of things that we can do. So I, I think um, um, medical, the medical field may benefit the most from this. Great. Um, I'll go to, to the next question. So what are the key tips to be prepared mentally for uncertainty? So for uncertainty, um, for example, I mean, anything can happen in the analog missions that I've done. So for me, making sure I'm prepared for what I do know we have to do and prepared really well for those things. And so when you have that much knowledge um, base, you can adapt that knowledge base to fit an uncertain situation. So for me, preparation is the, is the most thing, is the biggest thing that I can do and train and hone and sharpen skills and understand what's going on at each phase of whatever mission I'm a part of. Cool. So preparation for uncertainty. <laughs> um, then we have another one. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what are the long-term implications of something like COVID for space travel and for aerospace? So, yeah, COVID-19 is, um, it, it was, a surprise and we did have to reconfigure and we still got people launched into space and land um, back in Kazakhstan. So for us, um, hopefully it won't impact our launch capabilities or anything like that. But what it will change is how we um, do business um, to protect the crew from any kind of virus before they launch. Um, and then even on orbit, you know, how do we um, mitigate any impacts if they do occur? And so um, we would come up with the ways to do that. And, you know, I think in the future, we'll see how well they work. Um, mm -hmm. So far, we've not had any issues on orbit. So I think we've done a great job of mitigating um, the impacts of COVID on space, on our um, launch and landing capability. But um, we still have a lot to do, though. Um, we have a lot to understand about the virus. And, um, and so with that, I can see that we will have some operational changes, um, maybe small ones in the future. But once we really understand um, the mechanism of COVID-19 um, and then develop a countermeasure for that, then I think we'll go forward with um, a better plan. Yeah, hopefully we have a better understanding of it um, in the short term. We have another yeah, comment. Okay. Yeah, we okay. have another comment question. So um, someone okay. said, I think it's fabulous that you want to inspire 19 years old uh, to not give up on, their, on science and, and you will be a great model. Uh, who inspired you at an early stage, Jeanette? Well, uh, so for me, I was a weird kid. Um, 
loved anybody who was doing things and just getting out and doing things. So all of these, you know, heroes. Um, so my brother, when when I was nine years old, when he came home for co from college, and he was telling my sister and me about the female astronauts that were selected. So of course these ladies were um, heroes of ours. Um, you know, of course Sally Ride was amongst them. But even then, beyond that, of course Mae Jemison was just an incredible inspiration and and just the the spirit of being you know that person who's willing to be first. I don't want to be first on anything. It's such a tough job to be the first. And so, um, but, you know, on a ch kid level, you know, my sister and I, we really revered our mom. I mean, she had a tough job. She had a really tough job. And Gina and I saw firsthand, you know, trying to raise seven kids after having divorce. And her goal for Gina and me and our discussions that we would always have as kids was, well, you know, you gotta, she wasn't a scientist or an engineer or anything like that, but she did whatever she could to encourage us and keep moving us forward to follow our dreams. And she never once said to us that, well, why do you want to do that? Or you can't do that. We don't do that. And so just that encouragement of just saying, well, yeah, of course you can do that is yeah. for a kid is priceless because it can be that one word that you speak to that kid that changes their whole life. And so for us, for Jan and me, we had, um, we had big heroes as well, but um, our mom was our hero too. Amazing. So, I mean, I must say that if, if to become someone like you, you have to be a work kid, <laughs> work on <laughs> <laughs> um, We have another question. Um, so, did you, throughout your career, have the impression that you had to work harder than others to achieve certain goals, uh, both academically and career-wise? If yes, how did you cope with that? Well, I mean, I think... Um So I think I'm um, either real or perceived. Um, I felt the pressure of making sure that people knew that I could do the job. And um, it is a lot of stress for an individual to carry that. And so, you know, I, I think I just compensated by trying to work harder and prove that I was, you know, I've done all the work, I've checked all the boxes and, you know, trying to, you know, make sure that whatever my colleagues were doing You know, I was doing it, uh, doing the same thing and trying to do it better even. And so, you know, there are always times when you feel like you're not being treated equally and understanding that either it's real or perceived, you still have to perform on, on, a, on a higher level and make sure you're doing things well. Right. And it, it, is, it is kind of um, a, a tough situation because, you know, I keep saying real or perceived. Sometimes, you know, it could be our perception that we're being treated and it may not be real and this is where your yeah. your colleagues your friends and your your constructive criticism friends who are making sure that you're staying on as they come into play yeah and i think i, I guess that is also about uh, self-confidence right to believe that you can do those those things um we have exactly. another question <laughs> we have another question Um, yeah. How do you ensure that your energy and curiosity to learn is sustained in the long term? Oh, so maintaining my energy um, and sustaining this through the long term is the question, right? Yeah. Well, you know, every now and then you have to re-energize. And that's the big thing. And making sure you relieve stress regularly. regularly. So exercising four to five times a week taking that vacation where you absolutely do no work for a minimum two weeks solid um, and you can go back energized. It's, it's weird because I had to work in mission control yesterday as the Capcom and as I walked in the building, I was so happy and it was the, the weirdest feeling. But I mean, that just kind of showed me that I was really able to decompress, um, regroup and um, have just a clear mind and optimistic view of going back into work. And so I, I was surprised by how I felt, <laughs> you know, having to work eight hours. Um, it was a busy day. The, the day went by so fast. And that, that let me know that I really did get a chance to re-energize and um, get myself back to, you know, to a, an optimistic phase of going into work and doing the job every day. Good. And then we have two more questions, um, the two last questions. So. The, fr the first last question, what do you think about Elon Musk and SpaceX? 
<laughs> so, I mean, there's, I think um, we need people who are out there pushing the envelope and doing great things. Um, we as the government can't always do that because we, um, we have taxpayer dollars at our fingertips and we have human beings. And so we want to make sure we're doing the safe thing and the right thing. And, but we also need people who are pushing the envelope while maintaining safety. So I think he's done a wonderful job and not just a wonderful job. I think um, um, because he is this forward visionary thinker, I think we'll, um, you know, I think all of our future plans, who knows what he'll do. I'll just say that. I don't know what he'll do, but I know that we have a mission coming up and he's yeah. going to launch astronauts into space for the first time since July 2011. So I am grateful for that. Yeah. And we don't have to necessarily <laughs> go to Kazakhstan in the winter time, which I actually like the winter time, but it's very cold there. So, you know, I, I like what he's done. Yeah, I mean, I guess that some visionaries are, um, you know, we, we tend to see them as crazy until they, until they do the things, right? Um, exactly. we, do have, <laughs> we do have the last question. Um, I think it's, it's a nice question to wrap up um, the whole conversation. So what's your favorite space movie, Jeanette? <laughs> oh, gosh. Um, so I'm, I'm a big science fiction fan. So I have lots of things that I love and I watch over and over. Like, of course, um, Star Wars, Star Trek, anything to do with either of those I'm, I'm a big fan of. But I also watch movies like Dune, which is a weird one. And my recent favorite is The Expanse. Okay. Um, so yeah, so I'm, <laughs> I'm a huge science fiction fan. Um, and you know, I, I recently read um, some books by um, Mary Robinette Cowell and um, her um, view of how things could have turned out if we had a meteor hit the earth. So just fantastic things that, like that. Um, I do like to think, um, like to watch and read things that are fiction um, in my free time because that actually gives your brain a way to decompress too. You know, I always want to have something that's so serious all the time, but um, letting your brain kind of imagine and, and be free that way is, is good for me. Great, thank you. So followers, take note. Now that we are, uh, some of our followers are in lockdown, you have plenty of time to, to follow um, Jeanette's advice. So again, thank you so much uh, for being this evening with us. You've been, as always, super inspiring. Um, and thanks again, and see you soon, hopefully. <laughs> thank you, ladies, and thank you, thank you, Andrea. I look thank forward you. to seeing what you do in the future. <laughs> thank Bye, you, ladies. Guys. Thank yeah. you both. It's Thank you. Thank you both. Okay. Have all a great evening. You too. Adios. <laughs>